Welcome, Liberal Studies. Uh, <clears throat> here I am, sick as promised, but I have a great lecture for us. Um, I really do mean this is a wonderful lecture. It's a great thing you can do with your students. It connects, this lecture connects um, some things happening far away from California to California, which is really cool. So also, for those of you who maybe aren't going to be teaching fourth grade or eighth grade, you know, there's tons of material in here for you. You can basically take this lesson plan and use it in any history class. Um, so you're teaching history, do a little bit of art history, and that's what I'm going to give you today. So lecture is titled Impressionism in California. Um, uh, uh, you know, buckle up, let's go. Oh, except why are you not scrolling through? Oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> so let me give you a brief history of the artistic mo movement known as Impressionism. Impressionism is probably, and certainly for today's time, the most important artistic movement ever. It really marks a break from what art was before the Industrial Revolution to what art now is today, okay? Impressionist painters include some of absolutely the most famous painters that you see in the big museums all around the world, Monet, Manet, Cezanne, Pizarro, like all of them, okay? Impressionism was the first artistic moment, movement to turn away from realist painting techniques, really trying to capture, you know, a very real lifelike image, sometimes more than life, but um, very realistic type painting, in order to express the impression, and so it's called impressionism of a moment or a fleeting feeling with paint. Um, none of the other important modern artists, such as Van Gogh, who we call Expressionist, so he kind of takes a lot of Impressionism and goes even further. Picasso Cubism, uh, who, you know, things are all cut up and weird and, you know, stuff. Salvador Dali, who's doing his surrealism. Rothke, who's a really amazing 20th century artist. None of these guys would have uh, been able to do what they did without the Impressionist painters coming first. Um, what's the historical context of the rise of Impressionism? Well, there's two main causes for the rise of Impressionism. One is technological and one is political. Technologically, the invention of early forms of photography, such as the daguerreotype that was invented by a Frenchman, his name was Daguerre, and so daguerreotype was his invention. Um, we actually have early daguerreotypes of the gold rush, so we've just been finishing studying the gold rush, and a lot of the photographic images we have are exactly that, um, daguerreotypes. Um, these types of early forms of photography made real expression cheaper, faster, and more accurate than painting, thereby reducing the need for portraiture, one of the main ways artists could make money to survive. So especially if you're a kind of mid-grade artist, you didn't have a lot of popular renown, people are not you know, paying millions of dollars for your paintings when you're alive. One of the things most artists did was they did portraits as a way to just make money and survive. So local rich person, their family, their daughter, their wife, their dog, whatever they want painted, you show up. And it takes frequently months to paint a portrait, right? So um, he or she would sit there very still for long periods of time. They don't have to be there the whole time still. You can do a lot of filling in and stuff when they're not there. But as far as painting faces and things, um, you know, and getting the basic sort of background of the, uh, the basic outline and framing and everything, you had to sort of have them there present. And then, you know, if it takes three months to paint something, you get three months salary. So imagine spending $10,000 to have a local artist, which is, you know, not great money, but money you could live on, uh, to come paint your wife for three months. But there's a second reason, which is a political reason, which is quite interesting here, um, which is that in France, where even today, you know, France is still a great center of culture, Paris especially. Um, <clears throat> but at the time, uh, Paris really was the center of the art world. Uh, 
and all through the 19th century, I mean, Impressionism continues this tradition. You know, earlier, 1600s, 1700s, um, Paris was a great center of art, but so were many places in Italy, Rome and Florence. Um, the Dutch masters, there's a great Dutch tradition of painting. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, but by about 1800, France is really the center of the art world. But the Academy de Beaux-Arts, which is the Academy of Arts, of Fine Arts, basically had monopolistic control over holding gallery expositions. So if you if you're a painter and you wanted your art shown, especially to people who mattered, you had to go to them. They had to basically approve it. And then they would set you up with a gallery and people would come and you got more or less famous, depending on what people thought. <clears throat> the thing about that was the Academy uh, of Fine Arts in Paris was actually very closely aligned with the traditional power structure in France, which by the 1850s meant it was Louis Napoleon Bonaparte III, who was the nephew of the original Napoleon, and doesn't really matter that much, but he had kind of set up a semi-democratic, semi-authoritarian kind of regime in France, and that might sound weird to you, but this is actually quite common. He declared himself emperor for life, but they had elections, they had a parliament, he kind of listened to the parliament most of the time. Um, maybe a little something like what Russia is like today, although definitely not as mean. Putin is not nice. Not that Napoleon Bonaparte III was so nice, but he actually wasn't particularly mean. So I'll just give him that. <laughs> they actually called him Napoleon the Little, because his uncle, not even direct line, but his uncle had been the original Napoleon and he kind of ran and had this image of continuing the Napoleonic strain, but he was um, not as great of a leader and stuff like that. Um, so anyways, but what do you have here? So you have art really controlled and linked to a certain political uh, leaning. The preferred painting style of the Academy de Beaux-Arts was neoclassical. Neoclassical painting um, has strong connections to the, the painting and technical revolutions uh, of the Renaissance. So when you have Raphael, Donatello, Leonardo, all, you know, the Ninja Turtles, when you have the Ninja Turtles running around inventing and painting all these amazing things, they kind of set the terms for what painting is going to be like in Europe for a couple hundred years. It's not that there's not improvements or changes over those couple hundred years. There are, um, and especially stylistic changes. Um, excuse me, I'm going to have to pause for one second. Pause. Sorry about that. I have childcare as well, and he was screaming at me about something, but I'm back. So um, the neoclassical style was, you know, sort of still in the tradition in the line of what we had seen happen in the Renaissance. Very technical great use of color, um, lots of what we call representational allegory, meaning paintings themselves were kind of stories. And they were stories that people would kind of understand. Um, actually, a great painting done by a French painter here is Washington. I should have probably put it in here, but Washington crossing the Delaware with Washington on the boat and he's crossing the Delaware. It's this magnificent figure and it's telling and evoking this great story of freedom and struggling and surviving and taking risks in the greatness of Washington. Um, <coughs> uh, Neoclassical tended to take for their subjects um, periods from history, including the Bible, Greek or Roman mythology, Roman history, sometimes medieval history, saints, um, contemporary history. So what we see a lot of in the 19th century in France at this time period is uh, great battles from the revolution being uh, recreated, uh, things like that. Now, neoclassical wasn't the only way to paint. There are some other styles out there, including romantic. Uh, but technique wise, they weren't different. They were more just different in style. What kinds of colors they used, what kinds of subjects they chose. So romantic painting tend to be a little more emotional, um, more mythological, 
more creative, so you might just make up a scene, whereas neoclassical usually picked historical themes, um, uh, you know, things like that. But they're all doing very technique wise, they're doing very similar things. What this meant in France, circa 1850, was that the, the Academy de Beaux Arts and neoclassical painting actually had this very strong feel of propaganda. They were there celebrating French history, French nationalism, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte III, all of that sort of in this kind of propagandist, yay, let's all be French kind of style. <clears throat> so perhaps the greatest neoclassical painter is Jacques-Louis David. He's sometimes referred to as the painter of the revolution. Um, he had actually been one of the most radical members of the revolution. So he had spent time putting people basically to the guillotine. Like he supported like the most radical parts of the revolution. He's also a great painter. Um, and later in life, he ends up kind of compromising with Napoleon and painting Napoleon and stuff like that. So through Jacques-Louis David's life, we actually have this really interesting slice of French history, which at this point, the French Revolution was this amazing, important world historical event that really changed all of Europe. Um, uh, so, um, oh, last note, <clears throat> I'm going to show you some of <clears throat> Jacques-Louis David's paintings, but I want you to take notes on the paintings as we go. This is the type of thing that you'll do in an art class or a history class. I was a history major as an undergrad, and I always loved it when my professors would do a day of art and take notes as we're going about the different paintings and the different things that I say uh, about them. So this is Jacques-Louis David. This painting is just on the eve of the French Revolution. So the French Revolution breaks out <clears throat> 1789, just three years later. But there's this sentiment that people, you can kind of almost feel it coming. Um, uh, and so, like, I mean, look at this painting, right? Super technically correct, very strong use of lines. So if you look in the middle of the painting where you have the three swords, there's three brothers, that's the father. Um, they're all taking an oath to work together. The father is symbolic of the Roman state, the brothers of the citizen. They're going to fight to preserve the freedom of the citizens. Um, it's a little gendered here. You know, you have the women kind of in the background who are kind of feminine, but also, you know, not uh, active so much. So a more passive feminine uh, uh, notion here. The, uh, it's an oath of the Harati, right? So the Harati were these three brothers. And I mean, just look at how the lines, the drama, you kind of feel this intenseness with this painting. Um, uh, not sure if there's much else I want to put here, but, you know, it might seem odd to you like, oh, why are people, you know, painting this scene of Rome? But remember, as we saw with John Gast, with the goddess Columbia in her toga, even in America and through the whole Western world, uh, up to about 1900, Roman and Greek history was a shared vocabulary and knowledge that anyone with some education had access to. So you would be, you would go to school and one of the main things all schools made you read was the history of Greece and especially Rome, because Rome had been the greatest and biggest republic before Julius Caesar came and ruined it for everybody. That's what a lot of the French people thought who were inspired by the Romans and fought for the French Revolution. Rome had been the bastion of freedom in the Western world. They had picked up the torch of political liberty from the Greeks and literally spread it through the entire Mediterranean, all the way up through England, France, Spain, North Africa, all of those places. Um, this painting is maybe one of the most famous paintings ever. This is a beautiful painting. Um, this painting happened right in the middle of the Radical Revolution, 1793. Jacques-Louis David at this point is part of the Committee of Public Safety. He's in the French Parliament, which is cutting off heads. Um, and the character and subject of this painting is Jean-Paul Marat. Marat had been another one of the radicals. 
Um, he had supported the reign of terror. He was killed um, by a rival faction of people who were more aristocratic, and many of the aristocrats had fled France at this point. Um, and a young aristocratic woman actually lied and said she had information on aristocratic uh, conspirators, got into Marat's um, room, and killed him in his bath. He was in the bath because he had a skin condition. <laughs> so <laughs> he had to actually sit in a medicated soak. <laughs> but he was a great propagandist. And so that's why he's sitting there in the bath. It's not uh, nothing larger than that. Notice his right arm falling down towards the ground in this sort of like very sad uh, um, uh, motion with the quill he's writing. Um, I forget what it says on the on the um, on the the thing there. It's a pro it's a pro revolution kind of like pamphlet. And the death of Marat kind of came to symbolize how the French had turned on each other. So when Jacques Louis David painted this, he was still really strongly supporting the revolution. And this was kind of like, look at the martyr that Jean Paul Marat was He's sort of the martyr to the revolution. We have to keep going. He should be an inspiration to us. You know, the way his body looks, it's a little bit, um, it evokes images of Jesus on the cross. His arms are almost kind of, they're not crossed out like that, but they're kind of spread wide. He's hanging. He's got the thing on his head, um, <clears throat> very sort of pale and light skinned. So, uh, but today this painting is usually viewed as a little less the martyr of the revolution and a little more look at how the French had turned on each other and almost like um, an unintentional um, uh, unintentionally kind of demonstrating the failures of the revolution. Okay, well, so, you know, uh, Jacques-Louis David, he's painting for the revolution. He's a big supporter of the revolution. Um, uh, you know, even, but today, like I said, that painting, it's not really remembered the same way with his intent kind of with history, it kind of takes on this different layer of meaning. Um, <clears throat> and the radical revolution, although important at the time, has not lived well because cutting heads off aristocrats just isn't very nice. That was the inspiration for Alice in Wonderland. Off with their heads. It's like kind of like going in that same direction, kind of, you know, um, uh, appealing to that same, that same uh, historical event. Uh, <clears throat> even today in France, you're not allowed to point your finger at someone like this. You don't point at someone like that. It's very, very, very aggressive and dangerous. Le droit qui accuse, le point qui accuse, the point that accuses. You're, you're the conspirator. Take him, right? Um, so even in the United States, you know, if you point, it can be a little aggressive. But we point at stuff all the time. Nobody really cares. They'll do like the knuckle thing. You can do a full hand. They do a lot of nodding, which is kind of interesting, where it's a much subtler, more elusive kind of thing. Just a good, interesting side note. Um, now, what happens in history? Well, the French, the, the French are a mess internally in 1793. It's basically an internal civil war. They're engaged in a series of external wars <clears throat> in Italy, <clears throat> especially. Um, and Napoleon becomes the general who is actually winning wars. So Napoleon's in Italy, he's winning all kinds of, of battles and stuff. And he starts to create this domestic constituency. And over the next few years, Napoleon kind of continues to win more battles, continues to increase his domestic constituency. Um, at first he joins with a couple other guys and they have this kind of three person rule called the triumvirate, which again, harkens back to Rome, but then Napoleon just takes over. And here you go. Let me put my face away so you can look at this painting. Um, I mean, talk about propaganda, right? This is really glorifying Napoleon. It's Napoleon going at the St. Bernard Pass. This is as he's taking over France, basically. Um, he's on his horse. He is France. He's got his Napoleon hat that we all know. 
the horse is, you know, and the horse, the, actually the horse is France here. Napoleon's riding horse to the, the horse of France to victory. That's really what we're seeing here. You know, stark lines, um, amazing drama, hand pointed forward to the future. I mean, this is, you know, allegory, representational allegory in the propagandist style. I mean, this is, it's a beautiful painting too. I mean, it's amazing, but wow. Okay. Um, there we go. And, you know, next one really showing, uh, again, uh, 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 the kind of propaganda style. This is the coronation of Napoleon. And I mean, look now how far Jacques Louis David has come. I mean, from the death of Marat 13 years earlier, um, you know, glorifying the revolution. A lot of his other stuff was like very, had a lot of like regular people in it or the tennis court oath, which he never finished was a kind of ode to the different classes coming together early in the revolution. This looks like something that could be one of the old absolutist kings in France. I mean, Napoleon, this is Napoleon having himself crowned emperor, uh, um, which is basically, you know, functionally not complete, not super different from the king, except that you're just not born into it. Um, he actually even has the Pope uh, um, do a blessing for him. So he gets this Catholic kind of blessing as well. So there's bringing kind of religious justification to Napoleon's rule. Uh, I mean, I don't know if we need too much here. This is a bunch of pomp and circumstance. This is, this is elites. This is Napoleon. This is aristocrats. Napoleon does reestablish an aristocracy, but also maintains a lot of the merit, meritocratic ideas of the revolution and civil service and stuff like that. <coughs> and I mean, you know, wow, that's, that's really propaganda. That's what that is. So even though at this point, we're still a few decades away from the rise of impressionism, this style of painting was still dominant in France 50 years later, right? Um, the painters weren't quite as good as Jacques-Louis David. The political leadership didn't have the same greatness as the original Napoleon or the you know importance of the original French Revolution. And so in other words, things were a bit stale circa 1860 in Paris. Um, uh, so, let's, so let's get back to Impressionism here. In addition to the writers of photography and the political control exercised by, by the academy, there was at this point in Paris a general sense, and kind of all across the Western world, of searching for something new. The growth of large industry, scientific invention, uh, and more created the perfect storm for a painting revolution. Pushed away from the centers of power and facing the loss of the traditional livelihood due to cheaper competition, from rapidly evolving photography, painters began to search for new ways to express ideas. Starting in the 1860s, Monet, Renoir, Sisley, Sisley and Basile, who had met while training in the neoclassical mode, began a journey, journey together that turned painting towards a purely art, towards the purely artistic form we know now. They began painting different subjects, such as daily life and landscapes, as well as to turn away from purely represented, representational and realistic painting styles. Um, there's one other important moment here as far as the technology goes, which was um, the uh, uh, theoretical advances in optics, especially by Eugene Chevreul, uh, who argued that two colors side by side would be seen by the eye as a third mixed color. So what that meant, and this really inspired the um, Impressionists, was that they didn't have to mix colors um, to get the color they wanted. You could just paint the two colors and then the, next to each other, and then the eye would see it as a third color, okay? Um, <clears throat> one form of Impressionism uh, becomes called Pointillism, where painters painted just dots, and they just did all these little dots, and slight differences in color, and they did all of that. And then that created your eye really easily created uh, a, a pattern and a more consistent color there. Much the same way a digital camera is a bunch of just pixels. They're basically doing that, but by hand with a, with a paintbrush. The second um, piece here, uh, you know, very specific piece here is that 
Um, industrialization meant that you could buy pre-mixed paint and you didn't have to make color by hand. What that meant was that you could just, you could paint so much faster rather than spend weeks or months on one piece. Impressionists could produce a painting in an afternoon. Really huge difference here that, you know, sped up painting in an important way as well. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to now show us a, uh, a, a painting. Um, and uh, what I want you to do is to just sit and sort of think about it. So it's Claude Monet, one of the most famous uh, impressionists. It's called uh, Impression Sunrise. Okay. Uh, it's pretty early, 1872. So the techniques are there. They're kind of off and running, but it's not a fully you know, given another 20 years and like impressionism has moved worldwide, basically. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let the video roll for five minutes and then, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, and I want you to, in your notes, ask yourself the following questions. So write these down. How do you feel when you look at the painting? So how do you feel? What emotions does it evoke? How is light used? Think of shadow, color, beams of light. And how easy is it to make out the figures themselves in the painting? Okay. And I'm going to go away, make my little face in the corner go away. And then you will see the painting. Five minutes, take some notes. Yeah, and he's not quite ready to have me come back in so I can sit there. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Okay, it's been long enough, I think. Let's take a look at this painting together a little bit. So, you know, when I look at this painting, you know, I see this kind of, um, it's kind of foreboding. It's a sunrise, but you feel this sense of almost danger, um, kind of unease. Uh, you know, look at this stuff here. These are boats in the background, but it's so unclear to make out their shape. No hard lines distinguishing any of the boats. The sun here reflecting off the water. This is a classic impressionist technique we're going to talk about in a second. Just look at these big broad strokes, right? Just the impression of the reflection of the sun on the water. Not realistic at all. You know, this little guy in a boat. You can't really make out anything from him. He's just a dark figure. Um... <coughs> <laughs> some cool colors up here in the clouds clouds are impressions do a lot of fun stuff with clouds water um, and light so let's talk about the impressionist style oh here's another one uh, so this is another incredibly famous impressionist painting um, this one is a, a daily life scene um, Renoir Dance at the Moulin de la Galette, 1876. So Impressionism is kind of coming on, coming along. Um, you know, the faces are, you can make them out, um, but it might be hard to, if you ran into somebody in real life, be able to tell who, who the person from the painting was. But, you know, it's this classic French big um, dresses and, and, you know, fancy suits for the men and everything like this. Um, uh, just a, you know, a daily scene in Paris, and this is what the painters start doing. So let's talk about the technique. Um, the first, they call it plein air, outside, okay? Painting outside to capture color. So artists had spent most of their time in studios and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> You know, that that goes away. Some artists, as we'll see, will continue to because it is nice to control your conditions. So if you're painting a vase of flowers, which they like to do sometimes, or if you're doing a kind of semi-portrait type style, um, you might have a little bit more of an art studio way of doing things. Um, <laughs> but one of the fun things that Impressionists liked was the different colors that came about at different times of day. So uh, Monet himself would uh, paint his garden at Giverny over and over and over and over again, different times of year, different times of day. Uh, and it's exactly sometimes the same painting, but it very different color palette. The second important part of the technique is what we call diffusion, which are short one directional brush strokes that eliminate hard lines in the painting. Look here. You see here with us, this is diffusion here and here, right? These, this is just a really clear, great example of it. Just bam, 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 bam with your, um, with your brush. <laughs> Broken colors, this is what I was talking about with the invention in um, uh, optics. Painting one primary color on top of another to create a color mix on the canvas, not on the palette. So where you're um, also in pasta, these both are kind of are the same. Um, but, you know, everything can happen on the canvas rather than, and it, it gets a little bit messier, right? But it's, it's your impression. So they worked faster. Uh, they, uh, you know, um, uh, were, you know, and then broken color, mixing the paint on the canvas. And lastly, impasto mixing paint colors side by side or wet on wet. Um, you see that uh, through a lot of these paintings here. 
Um, notice that, you know, how beautiful the use of light is on this one, where you have this image of the light from coming through the leaves and it's kind of creating darkness and light like this guy, this guy here sitting in the foreground, his jacket, bam, 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 bam. That's the image of light coming through uh, from the um, from the leaves, the sun coming down from the leaves. They also uh, uh, change the subject a lot, okay? So whereas neoclassical, historical themes, great battles, biblical, some mythology, um, the Impressionist painted daily life, markets, parks, boats, just things that regular people were doing. They painted nature, gardens, oceans, landscapes, flowers, um, light, um, morning versus dusk, you get cool purples, oranges, pinks that come from varying light effects. So that's really cool. And a very emotive or fleeting kind of feeling that comes out from a lot of the paintings. Looking to express something that's kind of fragile, hard to capture, you know, and that's why it's impressionism. It's bam, here's this one moment. And what's the feeling of a moment? You know, it's, we, it's that type of thing that's on the tip of your tongue, right? But you can't quite always get it out. That's kind of what the Impressionists were going for. Um, look at this one, right? I mean, uh, really beautiful. Um, <clears throat> this is Cassatt, Lydia leaning on her arms. So this is a woman. She's actually at the theater. She's in a theater box. It looks like there's, I believe there's a, a mirror behind her. And that's why you see her back as well. But notice that like, it's very hard to see the distinctions between like the lines are not drawn super strong between, say, her shoulder. Look here. Where's my thing between her shoulder and the background? You only really get that from the colors themselves and the changing in color. Look at her dress. Right. This is all a lot of diffusion. Those short, those short strokes, um, you know, cool light effects up here. You know, the background very nondescript because it's dark, so it's hard to tell what's even going on in the background. So uh, let's bring this story to America then, because, you know, OK, time out. France is great. You know, go there. It's a fun place. But uh, <clears throat> um, uh, we're here to talk about California. So how are we going to get to California? Let me tell you how. Uh, well, first, in America, there were some important um, in this case, more romantic, what we would call uh, naturalist kind of painters, um, the most important of which being Thomas Cole and a bunch of guys who he painted with collectively known as the Hudson River School. We'll just look at a couple of Thomas Cole's paintings. Um, uh, uh, like neoclassical, they were strongly allegorical and representative, but the themes were a little bit different. Um, and they had a little more soup, like kind of bigger emotive kind of feel. You'll see what I'm talking about right now. Thomas Cole, this is like, he's great. You gotta go. Yeah. Anyways, we'll take a look at him. Okay. Uh, Thomas Cole is certainly the greatest American painter before the, before the basically like 20th century, late 19th century when, uh, impressionism takes off. Heavy allegories based on classical and biblical illusions. A lot of neo-Christian spirituality, including crosses, angels, beams of light, parting clouds, heavy use of dark greens and browns that characterized upstate New York. A uh, really deep, deep, thick, sort of rich painting. One of the other main themes in his work is water. Almost all of his paintings have water elements. Um, I think in this some says, some sense, this, I think in some sense this symbolizes American democracy at the time. Uh, but I'm not sure. I haven't, you know, gone and done a really super deep study of Thomas Cole. Um, but water frequently kind of has a, a democracy kind of element. Um, his greatest series of paintings is titled Course of Empire, which you can go look at. So strongly allegorical. It's amazing. But we're going to look at um, Expulsion from the Garden of Eden and the Subduing of the Waters of the Deluge. So, um, you know, got this one from public source images as well. Um, a little, not quite as refined look, unfortunately, but here on the right, 
you see this is the Garden of Eden. This is humanity that's been expelled. I believe that's Adam and Eve right there. Light, dark, the fall of humanity. The warning, this is what we were and this is what we've become. You know, this bright light coming through here looks like some kind of like uh, God, semi-God-like, but God has like removed himself kind of thing. That's what happens in the Garden of Eden. Lush nature, broken trees that are decaying. Or this one, the subduing of the waters of the deluge. This is after the, um, after the flood, um, uh, Noah's Ark, I almost said Napoleon's Ark, uh, Noah's Ark, a sense of renewal, right? God was mad at humanity. He sent the flood. He cleaned the slate. The waters recede, and there's this sense of renewal there. So water is both a source of life and of cleaning or destruction and, and renewal. Um, so, uh, you know, the water's here, the rocks, kind of a savagery, but then savagery is also a clean slate, something new to be redone. Go have fun with Thomas Cole if you like. You know, I, I just want to give you a sense of sort of like what was happening in America pre-impressionism. Uh, just as the neoclassical and romantic painters of the Hudson Valley School and Thomas Cole created a uniquely American style of painting, impressionism in California shows some particular characteristics in relation to European impressionism. The, as artists began to return from their training in Europe, they sought new subjects to paint, and California provided several conducive elements for these painters. First, the landscape was great. California has a vast and variated landscape that was excellent for plein air painting. There should be an E on that uh, air, but that's fine. Um, second, cost of living was cheap. So it was a lot cheaper to rent a place to live in Pasadena, where several of them were located, which is also my hometown, which is kind of funny, uh, than it would be in New York or Boston or, you know, any place. Third, light was good with little rain. Um, and then also the excellent color palettes at dawn and dusk. So, you know, it was a really great setup for these painters. The other thing that happens with California Impressionism is the style kind of changes a little bit as it migrates to California. They used the same techniques, but they changed, they added a little, some smaller elements of, of more traditional neoclassical touches, just small elements, um, and then also some different thematic focus. Um, in addition to the landscapes, uh, light and scenes from daily life common in all Impressionism, the decaying missions and presidios were favorite subjects of California Impressionists. They also had a bit more of a nostalgic way of painting, which is partly reason why they're attracted to the missions. Rather than rush into the future, they had a sense of melancholy for the decay of the old. So to a certain extent, you know, Impressionism is maturing here as well. It's a little bit later. We're bridging to the 20th century and actually most of the paintings I'm going to show you are early 20th century now. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, you get to California, you see those missions and they kind of evoke a romantic past. And so you still have that impression. You still have the, the, the momentary impression. But the mission itself is a remnant of, uh, you know, uh, a former human thing that is gone, that the people are gone from. And so it kind of naturally lends itself to a little bit more of a melancholy or sad approach. Um, and then lastly, they tended to give a bit sharper definition to shapes, often using hard lines uh, to mark outlines of persons or things which was not as common in mainstream Impressionism. The two people we're going to look at are Richard E. Miller and Franz Bischoff. They had both trained in Europe. This was, so had Thomas Cole. So any American painter who really wanted to be good had to go to Europe. And that's no longer true. Uh, you don't have to make the sort of pilgrimage <laughs> anymore to Rome or Paris. But a lot of American artists do like to do that because they still have very lively, vibrant, artistic scenes. <laughs> and both of these guys had been in Europe for a really long time and then actually returned due to the outbreak of World War I. 
So they were there practicing, um, in most cases, working with, you know, artists from around the world who are all doing Impressionism. So they're all there working together, continuing sort of Impressionism. And then they have to leave due to the war. They come back to America. They go to California. Uh, so, I mean, they, look at how beautiful this painting is. Um, uh, 1910, the necklace. Uh, uh, it's just before the breakout of World War I. Um, you know, notice the use of all the masterful impressionist techniques. Um, uh, diffusion, impasto, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, all of that broken, uh, broken color. But then notice, like, look here at the dress itself and notice how much softer these, these strokes are and stuff like this. So these are, um, let me come right back. Okay, apologies for that. You probably heard my little boy in the background. I want this, I want that. Um, I put a movie on so I could get this done and then <coughs> the rest of the day is daddy duty. Okay. Um, Wow, look at this painting. This is a really beautiful painting. Look at this really fine brushwork though here on the dress, right? Um, she, you know, it's, it's, you see all the classical impressionist stuff, but this is like a little bit of a lighter, slightly more refined style. He's spending more time on doing these brush strokes, so he's not painting quite as quickly. The ruffles in the dress creating, where am I? Where's my, there you are creating these really fine lines here, strong lines, which you can really see and marking it off. Same with the chair, very clearly delineated. In contrast to a little bit more of the stuff in the background, the window has a pretty strong line, but a lot of this other stuff, the lines are fading out a bit, although the mirror <laughs> there has a pretty good line. Um, you know, theoretically a scene from daily life, although this one is almost certainly posed. Um, and you get this sense with Bischoff that, you know, he's doing that. He did tend to paint a little bit more in studios or inside where he could control the light the way he wanted to, um, which is fine, right? Um, a lot of impressionists are going to be doing that as well. You can control things, gives you a little more time, uh, et cetera. But just, I mean, that's those pinks and those little hues are just amazing. Oh, here we go. Uh, another one. So he painted a lot of these kind of portraits. I couldn't find the uh, year on this one. The green cage. So there's a bird here in the cage. Again, really beautiful details on the scarf and the dress. Great colors coming out. The use of light where she's kind of darkened in the background is very bright, bright and lighting her face differently. Um, you can Google around and Franz Bischoff. He was great. Look at the curtains, like it's so hard to do this where you have this kind of where you can get this sense of this translucentness of the curtain. That's very difficult to do. Um, another friends, Bischoff, look here, really strong. Look at the guitar, strong, kind of aggressive strokes, actually. Um, but then the back, all the impasto diffusion and all of that kind of stuff. Again, the, the, also the piano, very strongly marked. I mean, you can kind of see it almost looks like he traces this, you know, these very thick, clear black lines. But then look at her hand here, it just kind of disappears. You can't barely see it. It's hard to, you know, your brain has to fill that part in, um, you know, uh, really beautiful. And like, that's actually a flower. This is a flower in a piece of glass. So that same kind of the the how glass reflects light in different ways that's so difficult to uh bring out um really i mean this guy's a great painter more landscape focused um franz bischoff uh i mean wow talk about grandeur right this is uh feeling kind of overwhelmed by nature in a way you might see some hints kind of of the naturalistic style from thomas cole this like little man, big nature kind of feel, um, obviously in the more impressionist style. Uh, Fran, this painting especially evokes some Paul Cezanne who did a lot of these big landscapes and painted a lot more in Spain. 
And Spain has more browns and reds and things like California does. So it maybe evokes some Paul Cezanne who did some, especially like look at these foothills here. Like, look at that. That's like really amazing. And then just the kind of hints of uh, 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 bushes in the foreground. This is right by where I grew up. Arroyo Seco Bridge, still standing. It looks a lot different today, but it's an incredibly famous bridge. It's been there forever. Uh, Seco just means um, ravine, uh, basically. So it's it's just a big ravine. The Rose Bowl is in the Arroyo Seco, and this bridge is really close to the Rose Bowl, which is built actually not long after this painting was done. Um, uh, Believe it or not, this bridge is colloquially referred to as Suicide Bridge because when it's the big drop and it's beautiful and people go and do it all the time. And uh, so that's kind of a sad moment of this bridge. But during the Great Depression and then again during the Great Recession, it was very common to see people um, taking their own lives here. But look at the contrast here. So you have the, the, the valley or ravine here these kind of soft, pale browns and greens and stuff like that. And then this is the San Gabriel Mountains and the clouds and all those purples and blues and these light whites and like really great different hues coming out there. That's, that's a great uh, impressionist landscape right there. Uh, this is near Palm Springs. So this is kind of like desert kind of look. So again, maybe some hints of Paul Cezanne or something like that. Rocky Mountains, these, uh, I think those look like cactuses in the foreground and just some small shrubs, you know, not super fine detail. And over here, the way it goes, it almost looks like uh, grass, but that's, I believe, just the top of cactuses and shrubs as your mind, as your brain sees them disappear into the, into the distance. It just creates this image of almost like one clear color, which is really beautiful. Isn't that great? That's really great. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to get one of the missions, so I found one from Bischoff as well. Uh, you know, this is just, this is a garden and beautiful. Look at this dark and then the light and the green, beautiful colors down here at the bottom. You know, this guy here, the contrast between this colonnade and this one with the light, the roof, a uh, very romantic image here, very pastoral. This one kind of portrays the missions as very pleasant almost. You almost feel like you're in Paris at a garden party or something like that. You know, they weren't that nice, unfortunately. Okay, um, so that's our quick tour through the various Impressionists. Um, there's a lot more on the Canvas online resource. You have a link to California Impressionism and you can go follow up there. And it's a cool wild world. There's too much to even uh, begin to basically summarize at this point. Impressionism even today in California is a very strong artistic movement. It's not quite as prevalent. It's not considered a high art the way it was anymore. It's more everyone's doing Impressionism. Um, uh, so, but, you know, Impressionism is where you begin before you go learning more advanced techniques as an artist, these, especially as a painter these days. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you... Uh, like I did a Google search, I was looking for something from one of these classic impressionists on the missions. I did, you know, impressionism, uh, painting mission and 20 different contemporary artists who are very talented, doing very good work, you know, maybe not the same level as Bischoff or, or Miller, but wow, you know, I can't do that. Uh, all selling their work and they'll have little studios and they're selling their works for usually a few grand at a time. Uh, and that's what an artist, that's what art generally goes for. Um, <clears throat> um, through the 20th century, the same things that brought California painters like Miller and Bischoff here to begin with continued to be true. The landscape was beautiful. The light was good. The cost of living was cheap. Um, the recent housing crisis is, relatively speaking, pretty recent. 
It really didn't kick off seriously until the 1990s, but it was a product of decisions that we made as a state starting back in like the late 70s. And we're still trying to fix and make up for some of those decisions. Um, if you take my class in political science, I will take you through some of that, but we're not doing that here. Um, <clears throat> but through the entire 20th century, not just Impressionism, Impressionism stayed strong, but all kinds of other artistic moments and movements and people are in California. And California really does become a real center of uh, the visual arts and the fine arts. Uh, okay, now we're not done yet. This is a lesson plan that you can use with your students, okay? Um, and it's actually really easy to teach impressionist styles of painting to your students. I think in the future, I may make us buy pastels and we might actually do it together as a team. Um, I actually think that might be really fantastic and amazing. Um, pastels are kind of, um, they're basically kind of like a chalk. They come in all different colors and you can create this very impressionist style by just using pastels on um, regular artist paper. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the first, so this is a link here to pastels. It's also up on canvas. I'm not going to show you this link. Um, I will show you some of the other ones to explain how to do it, but they just come in a big bank. It looks like, you know, it's basically chalk. Somewhere in between chalk and um, uh, crayon, actually. Um, step one, have your students pick a picture from some place that they want to paint. Try to have them pick something in the impressionist style, a daily life, a landscape, you know, something like that. They can paint anything. They might want to paint their uncle or something. They might even have a photograph they want to bring in or their grandmother, whatever. I don't care. You don't care. You can paint anything as long as it's appropriate. Next, how are we going to make it easy for untrained people to keep uh, proportions right and figure out sort of uh, um, where things need to go on their larger canvas from their smaller painting? Oh, great place to go to, magazines, okay? Mag oh, back. Magazines are great places to find inspiration. You can just pull, rip something out of a magazine that you wanna paint, and go forward from there. Next, you want to use the grid system, which I am going to show you. So I'll just pull up the link for us. The grid system is used even by a lot of artists today, okay? Um, so I remember being <laughs> a graduate student and meeting some people in the MFA, Masters of Fine Arts program. And I go, oh, you know, my high school math uh, my high school art teacher showed us this grid system, et cetera, et cetera. They go, oh, yeah, we all do it. I'm like, what do you mean you guys do it? You guys are the high artists. They're like, yeah, look, only people who are super, super trained have been doing this forever don't use the grid system. Pretty much everyone uses the grid system. So what is the grid system? Okay, look here. See, you have your original here, and you break it up into a grid, and then you have the same amount of lines on your bigger paper, and then you just need to count the lines to know where things go. You won't get it perfect, but this is also impressionism, so that's fine, okay? Um, and notice here, you count down the side. You can also just have students fold their paper. So do one fold in the middle and then two folds, uh, one fold on each side, and then same on the top and create a little easy grid system that way, okay? So choose a photograph, okay? Um, it doesn't have to be four by six. It can be whatever size they want. Choose the size of your paper, grid the photograph, grid your paper, right? With the same number of boxes. That's all you gotta do is keep the same number of boxes and the same, as long as even, you know, stretch between the boxes. And then just start drawing, right? Start with something easy. Start with where the shoulders are. Start with here. Start with the top of the hair, something like that. And you draw it with pencil and you can erase and fix and stuff like that. And then on top of that, you can just start laying down your pastels. If some students want to take a pen and draw some particular outlines, kind of much like Bischoff did, they can absolutely do that. Um, and then after the grid system, you seriously, you just pastel. Just start using your pastels. Get them out and 
start doing colors and do those singular brush strokes the way most of the uh, uh, impressions did it. Um, you can also learn some a little more uh, fancy type stuff. So let me show you um, uh, an easy pastel drawing and painting, an intro for beginners. You know, anyone can do this. Now, you and I are probably aren't going to be able to pull off something quite this good, but look at that beautiful impressionist landscape. Wow. And you might be surprised. Students, I mean, I, I did this. <laughs> Not this well, but I only did one because that's all our teacher made us do. And you know what? I still have it in my attic somewhere. And it's kind of, I don't want to get rid of it because it's like one of the few pieces of art that I've ever made that actually I could like, look, it looks like something. And we were like, yeah, that looks like an impressionist painting of a wave crashing, which is what I chose to paint as a, as a young adolescent. Okay. Um, so, wow, this is a really cool thing you can do with your students. The other great thing about, um, I also have a color theory link for you here. The other great thing about what you're doing here is you're teaching them some basic math intuitively at the same time and some color theory, some art history, some art techniques. It's a great assignment that overlaps all of these different things. And then you want your parents to be happy with you, send those kids home with their piece of art and have their, and have their parents look at it and they will be so impressed and they will love you forever. Okay, so once again, Professor Selby uh, really you know, giving you really great techniques that cut across a bunch of stuff and that you can use for uh, your students as well.